morning, Unity Church of San Antonio. Good morning. Beautiful bright lights out there. Woo. Yes, well, I am Pamela, and I am your celebration host this morning. And so we're going to share our vision. We, you notice we have a new vision that was put together by the congregation. It's a lot of input from everyone. So let's state our vision for the world together. As divine love, we envision a spiritually transformed peaceful world. Wow. Then we take that vision for the world and we make it personal by stating our mission. We dance in the truth of who we are through meditation, study, and service. Wow. Powerful. Well, this morning we have a very special guest with us, Reverend Erica Forbes. We are truly honored and blessed to have her with us today and I want to tell you just a little bit about her and then you're going to get to meet her here although she's been here before so some of you may have may have had the experience of of Reverend Erica before and you're going to be really excited to have her we're all excited to have her back so Reverend Erica Forbes is a licensed ordained interfaith minister and the founder and chief visionary officer of the awakening spiritual community an emerging emerging all-inclusive all loving spiritual community located in San Antonio. She's extremely hands on in the growth and development of this independent spiritual movement. She is a licensed spiritual counselor and is the CEO of Awakening CoLab, a spiritual events community or a spiritual events company. In addition, she maintains a private consultancy in marketing and public relations. She's the lead facilitator and moderator on subjects that stand at the intersection of spirituality, social justice, and change leadership. Wow. She is a sought after trainer and diversity consultant as well as a presenter at major LGBTQ conferences. She is a national public speaker on the issues of spirituality, sexual orientation, and vision. Reverend Erica received her license and ordination as an interfaith minister from One Spirit Interfaith Seminary in New York City, and she has a master's in world religions and a BA in education. Wow, well, let's welcome her. Wow. Thank you. All right, and I wanted to greet our online listeners and uh, for anyone listening, and if you want to hear this again, you can go back and, and listen to our podcast, right, Bertie? I said thanks to Cheryl Ann. Yes, thank you, Cheryl Ann. Yes. And our youth, you'll notice our youth is not here. They go directly to their classrooms now. And so let's send a special blessing to our youth. Together, children and teens, we know who you are. You are the light of God. We love you. We bless you. We celebrate you. And we see you doing great things. So as we move into community prayer, let's just take a moment to relax. Close your eyes. If you'd like. Breathe. Become centered. In this present sacred moment, I recognize my connection to the universe and its divine guidance influence in mine, in our lives. We know we are surrounded by a sea of possibilities and potentiality that awaits our awareness and alignment with them. So in this moment, we center ourselves and connect with the supreme universal intelligence in the invisible side of life. We claim our good through our declaration and expectation of what we want to manifest in the visible side, creating the life that we love living. Knowing that this intention and deep desire accompanied by our gratitude that it has already taken place directly influences the universe to respond in kind magnetically 
and perfectly. We move into deep knowing that as we believe, we conceive, and the universe responds to our every thought and anticipation of our highest good. We release this prayer knowing that it is already done in the mind of spirit, and therefore it is ours now. And so it is. This musical team is just extraordinary, aren't they? Thank you. Thank you. I want to just take a moment to thank everyone that had anything to do with the unfoldment of today's service. I happen to know it takes a lot of people to make it look like nothing has happened. Uh, and a special thanks to Birdie for all that she does. I just want to take a moment and drop into prayer. And in our spiritual community, we surrender the mind to the heart, which is why we bow our heads. Do what feels natural to you. In this moment, I just stop. I recognize and I realize that all the power and all the presence and all the love is right here. That it doesn't belong outside of me, it is within me. And in this moment, I get out of the way and I allow the Spirit of the Living God to hear what needs to be said. I allow the Spirit of the Living God to guide and direct this talk. I know that everyone that is sitting in this seat is hearing what they need to hear, opening their heart in a way they've never opened it before so that they may be who they are here to be. For all of this and so much more, I give thanks by simply saying, and so it is. Amen. I have to tell you, this is so much fun to me. I mean, it's fun to me to come back and in a way, it's starting to feel like home. You know, sort of like, not like your home, like when you go home and then you have to clean the closets, but like home when you go to like your mom's house and then you just get to sit there and you get to have fun and she feeds you stuff and you don't have to clean up anything. You know, just like fun, home like that, like my second home. So I want to thank all of you for allowing me to come and be part of this community. And I have, to, I have to tell you, I feel like a part of this community. When she said, hey, if it calls you, I'm like, I might join. I know I have my own, but I'm like, I, this is my other home. So thank you, thank you so much. You know, I, I don't often read from books when I speak. I prefer to just open and allow the spirit of the living God to move through me. But today I want to, uh, I want to share a bit with you, and I, I just realized this is just looking raggedy. Which is a good thing. Your books should look raggedy. They should not look beautiful. They should like the spine should be broken. Things should be falling out of them because that means they are well loved. So I'm reading, I'm going to share a little bit from the revealing word written by Charles Fillmore. If you don't know who he is, you will, you will come to know and love him. And I realized that I actually bought this. This was my very first book when I moved into metaphysics and, uh, and I wrote to myself for better understanding. And this was when I didn't know what was going on, but I knew I needed a dictionary so I could figure it out. And I want to share with you really quickly, it's a dictionary of, of metaphysical terms. And the reason I want to give this to you so is that we have a context for what we're about to talk about tonight, today. And I'm starting under the definition of power. And it's very unique because power is one of those things that people have a funny relationship with. But I want us to become comfortable and familiar with power because it's a beautiful thing when it's used correctly. So Charles Fillmore says, power is man's innate control over his thoughts and feelings. A quickening from on high must precede his realization and dominion. So I just, just let that sit with you for a minute because then I want to move to a definition on prayer, which is something that I think is probably the most beautiful definition of prayer that I've ever heard. And now let me just tell you, it's not all floaty and you know angelic-like. This is a powerful definition. And so uh, he says, and I'm dropping you sort of in the, minu in the middle of this, but he says, communion between God and man, that also means woman, we know where we're going with this. Prayer is more than supplication. It is an affirmation of truth that eternally exists, but which has not yet come into consciousness. It comes into consciousness not by supplication, 
but by affirmation. And I have to tell you, that is powerful for me. Because when I grew up, I grew up in a beautiful, beautiful church environment. My great-grandfather was a minister, and so we were at church night and day, day and night, weeks on end, it felt like to me. Um, but, but in our, our religious upbringing of my childhood, prayer was something where you just, you know, got down on your knees and you begged God to please have mercy on your miserable sinner-like personality in hopes that something good would happen for you. Now, I have to tell you something about myself. In, in, a, in a need to be fully transparent, I'm not a, a, a begging kind of person. I'm just, it just, it's just not part of my construct. I'm not a pleading kind of person. And so, so this idea of begging and pleading some reluctant deity far off in the sky, some man with a beard and a laptop checking me out, it just, it just didn't resonate with me. Needless to say, I was in trouble at church a lot. <laughs> but when I started to step into these metaphysical teachings, this new thought, if you will, this new way of being, and I stepped into it at a young age, as I look back on it now, it was grace that brought me there, or crisis, whatever you want to call it. And what happened was it, it made sense to me. It made sense to me because at that time, I felt like religion was an insult to my intelligence. I mean, the idea that, that, you know, God was like either Santa or a madman seemed really insane to me. And so I just felt like that's just not going to work. But as I stepped into these new teachings that didn't insult my intelligence and required me to be a thinker, I was like, ah, oh, this is where I want to live. This is where I belong. Now, I have to be honest with you, no one is more shocked than I am that I was a minister, that I became a minister, because it just, let me just tell you, if you knew me in my 20s, my 30s, no. Minister was not what you would call me. Other people have other terms for me. But I'm getting, I'm getting way out of the box here. I want to talk about the topic today. And the topic that I, I shared with Birdie is, is the, the power of possibility, prayer, and play. And I have to tell you, this, this idea, this thing about power, I, you know, right now, power is getting a bad rap. It's getting a bad rap because there's some of us that, are, and I say us because there's one of us, there's only one of us here, many expressions of the one. So some of us are, are using our power in, let's just say, maybe not the, the most productive way. And this has been going on for a while. It didn't just start at November 9th of 2016. It's been going on for a while. So let's not try to act like this is new. Some of us have been using our power in a way that is not useful. Now, the thing about power is it's a spiritual quality that each and every one of us uh, is loaded and encoded with. We came with it. It's part of our very DNA. And so we get to use it the way we want. It's sort of like fire. You can use it to heat yourself or burn down a building. The choice is yours. And so we have this thing called power that some of us are sort of like, I don't know, let's say a two-year-old who's had chocolate. And there we're just wielding this power all over everywhere without any kind of command of this powerful tool called power. But that's not us. That's not you. Hi, everyone out there in Facebook world. I just wanted to stop and say thank you for joining us at Unity of San Antonio. If you're not here, you are missing some incredible people. Just thought I'd tell you. <laughs> power. Power is this incredible tool that when you harness it, when you, when you pull it up from the depths of your being, it becomes like a laser. And you can use it to carve out a, a window or a door, or a path to whatever it is you truly want and desire. But the choice is yours. You get an opportunity every single day to decide consciously how and in what way do I want to use my power. That's the beauty of God, right? That we have been given dominion, free will. I'm not sure I would have given all of us free will, but hey, that is that, that, I get it. I totally get it. But we've been given this free will to utilize this tool called power, this spiritual quality, 
any way we see fit. We get to decide. We get to wake up every day and we get to say to ourselves, I am going to use my power for good. We get to wake up every single day and say, I'm going to use my power for the not so good. We get to wake up every single day and decide, I'm going to use my power for less than pleasant things. And sometimes we do it consciously and sometimes we do it unconsciously. But here's the thing, the universe doesn't care. God doesn't care whether we're using it consciously or unconsciously, we just get to use it. Again, back to my theory, why God gave us the use of power, I have no idea. But here we have it. Now here's what we get to do today. We get to decide, do we want to use our power to create an infinite possibility? Now here's the beauty of possibility. Possibility can be anything we want. I know. You may have some friends, some loving relatives, that will always tell you, no matter what you say, that's not possible. Perhaps you're the one telling your loved ones that's not possible. I didn't say probable. I said possible. And there is a difference between the two. The probability of me standing here before you would pretty much be impossible if you knew me back when. If you knew that I was born to a teen mother who hid the pregnancy until she was eight months pregnant, and if you knew that I was single and on welfare and homeless at one time, if you knew that at one time I didn't know what I was going to do, hadn't finished school, and then had a child, if you knew that I was a black lesbian, if you knew that at some point I didn't know where my next meal was going to come from and that I was on the other side of the country, if you knew all of that, the likelihood of me standing here would be unlikely. But that's why I'm not talking about probability. I am talking about possibility. And possibility is so big and so vast and so deep that, that we get to step into it at any time. This is the good news. Because we get to decide on any given day what our possibility looks like. We get that right. No one, no government, no family, no culture, no society, no rules gets to decide that for us. And at this moment, particularly at this time in our history, of course, all human creatures think at this moment in this time in history, but particularly for us, it's imperative. It's imperative that we step into this infinite possibility of creating a world that works for everyone, not just ourselves, not just the people in unity, not just the people that we love, not just the people we like, not just the people that voted the way we want, not just the people that look the way we look, not just the people that we engage with, not just the people in our house, but creating a possibility of a world that works for everyone, that's the kind of possibility we want to use. That's the kind of power we want to use. And I say, absolutely, absolutely. I, I'd like to think that I'm in good company with my brother Charles Fillmore, my brother Jesus the Christ and the Buddha in creating some radical ideas here. I must be in good company because all of you are here. And at some level, you agreed to begin to think about possibility. Now, I know we have news outlets. I know we have naysayers. I know at some point in any given day, we may be the ones saying, this is probably a disaster. I get it. But we have the power to choose our thoughts. We have been given the power to allow our words to create our reality. This is what it means to use that power as a laser, as a tool, as a guidepost. And so I just want us today to make that secret and silent commitment to use our power in a way that we've never used it before. When we do that, each and every one of us has the ability to create something we've never seen before. I know that for 100% fact. I know, facts are sketchy these days. We're, we're not sure what's going on with facts, 
but you know the truth when you hear it. No one has to tell you. No one has to prove it to you. You know. You can feel it in your body. And so when I tell you to say to yourself, anything is possible, your body will answer that with a resounding yes. And it will be so amazing that you won't even care what society says or what the bell curve says or what the history books have said or what your mama and them said. You will know for certain that you have it within you to create anything. It won't matter whether you're disabled or differently abled or the color of your skin or the age you are or if you have no money or if you have a lot of money. It won't matter. You will know that within you is something possible. Now let's talk about this thing called prayer. I said earlier at the definition that prayer is an affirmation, not a supplication. And so we don't have to, in our spiritual community and in our knowledge, beg. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not above getting on my knees. Trust me, there have been some moments when I'm like, look, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. But I remember as a child, I saw my grandmother do this, and it seemed to work for her, so there I am. Sometimes life brings you to your knees. But that's okay. That posture is a place of surrender. But in your mind and in your heart, you don't have to beg God to be God. You don't have to beg for something to be given to you. You don't have to beg. You simply step into a place of powerful, dynamic awareness you affirm what you know has to be true, even if you can't see it. Let me tell you, you know who does this really well? Seven-year-olds. <laughs> Seven-year-olds, they are little praying machines. And I tell you this because I have a daughter who will be 27, and she, when she was seven, she realized, and she's only grown up in new thought, and let me tell you something, when you grow them up in this new thought, they use that like nobody's business. And so she would just step up in her seven-year-old way, and she'd say, I know that the power and presence of God is going to get me that cat. No matter what, I, no matter what happens, I know I'm going to get it. No matter what they say, I know, Mom, no matter what you say, if I affirm it and I know it, I will get that cat. Let me tell you something, that little girl got that cat. <laughs> she never even talked to the cat after I got it. But it didn't matter. The point of the story is that she used affirmative prayer. She understood that if she says it and she keeps saying it, that it will manifest itself. And so I'm telling you that in this day and age, we need to pray like seven-year-olds. We need to affirm that we already have what we want, that we are already creating a world that we want. The power lies in prayer. It lies in affirming the thing until it comes into form because the universe has already said yes. That's its job. Its job is to say yes to whatever we want. We want war, there you go. We want disaster, there you go. It is always fulfilling itself. And if you're not sure, let me give you a little opportunity to check yourself. Whatever you say on a consistent basis, because your thought is a prayer. Whatever you say, whatever you think, I'm broke, I'm broke, I'm broke, I'm broke. Guess what? The universe says, yes, ta-da, whatever you want, whatever you want. And so today, you get to step into using affirmative prayer in a constructive and conscious way. This is, this is good news. This is good news. And so you can scan your life. You can look over at the times in which you begged and beseeched, in which you affirmed that which you even didn't want. And you will have your answer as to whether or not affirmative prayer works. Because that's where the power lies. It lies in affirming it until it comes into fruition. Look, all you got to do, go ask a seven-year-old. They will tell you, yes, this thing works. No matter how many times I bug my mom for something, eventually I get it. <laughs> that is affirmative prayer in action. And then we step into this beautiful thing called play. Now, I have to tell you, if you're ever on my Facebook page, I have a very playful spirit. I, it tends to have several cuss words, but that's not here nor there. <laughs> but the point is, I tend to live in a place of play. It could be because for 14 years of my life, I taught nothing but children, and so I just stayed in that place. But when you step into this playful place, when you're able to allow yourself to drop all of these bags that we carry called adulting, and you step into this playful place, all of a sudden, the light 
and the life of God comes through you. It guides you. It compels you. When you look at children, no matter how bad the world is, you take them to a park and they just start playing. We can tell them a meteor is coming in five minutes and they'll be like, can we get ice cream? Because it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Because they stay in that place of play. Now I get it. We bought into this idea that in order to, to have what we want, we've got to get serious. We, we've, got to, we've got to step into reality. We've got to get serious about life. They start drilling that into us as soon as we can walk. You need to seriously walk, little baby. And I'm telling you, you, you don't. You don't. You don't. You get to use the power of play to lift your heart up. And there, from that lightness of being, from that what I call holy silliness, the answer shows up. I'm telling you, on any given day, something could be trauma and drama happening, and I'll just turn on the music, and I'll just start dancing around like I'm crazy. Because here's the thing. When you start to get serious about things, life starts to constrict. You start to cave in on yourself. Your body starts to constrict. Your ideas start to constrict. And all of a sudden, it's a block and a stoppage. But when you start to play, whatever that may be for you, your partner may come in the house and, and you guys have been fighting for a week, I don't know, and if you just hit them upside the head with a pillow and then give them one, all of a sudden, whatever it is you were fighting about becomes as ridiculous as it was when you began. That's the gift of play. That's the power of play. When we step into it, and believe me, I don't care if you're 80 or 88, if you stop and you begin to step into what does it look like to play for you that may be painting for you that may be going out and skipping in the park for you that may be getting uh, uh, whatever it is you know what it looks like and if you don't know what it looks like today is a good day for you to figure that out what does it look like for me to tap into the power of play because that's where the answers are when you look at children on a regular basis, they're up there, they're just creating buildings, they're doing all kinds of things, they're imagining the possibilities, they're affirming the absolute truth, and then they play like there's nobody's business. And before you know it, they are these magical beings living in a place of light and love. We are those same children, we're just a little bit bigger. We're the same, we've just forgotten, but not today. Today, you get to be reminded that within you is a power and a presence so dynamic, so big, it can transform the world and pay your rent. Whatever the deal is, whatever it is you have going on, when you stop and you remember that the power lies in my possibility thinking, that the power for change lies in my prayer of affirmation, that the power of dynamic good lies in me playing in a way that is filled with joy, enthusiasm, and excitement, then life changes. And then all of your friends will be, what happened? How did you get out of that last crisis that you were in? Well, I just stopped, I affirmed the absolute truth, and then I went to the park. <laughs> But don't just believe me. Test it out for yourself. Give yourself a week. Just a week, seven days, that's all I'm asking. I mean, if, if the world could be created in seven days, surely you could do something in seven days. Let's just try it. Let's just try it. Give yourself an opportunity to prove these laws that I'm talking about only within your own life, only within your own soul. And then you know that Reverend Erica wasn't just getting up there talking and screaming and jumping around like a crazy person. She actually knew what she was talking about. She reminded us that within each of us, there is a power and a presence and a love that can transform my life and everyone else's life, that could transform and heal the world. And I'm going to use it. There is a power for good. It is accessible to you when you stay in possibility, when you live from a place of affirmative prayer, and when you play like your life depends on it. When you do that, this world will become the world that works for everyone. As always, stay awake. Thank you for having me.